Every spring, the desert blossoms with life. And since 1922, no flower has sprouted with such constant brilliance than Arizona's desert rose. A rose that has stayed true to herself and her small town ways. Her infectious love for people and this state brought stability and healing to Arizona at a time when its citizens and leaders needed someone they could trust. Someone who could set political ambitions aside and make our wonderful state blossom once more. My name is Rose Mofford, and I was born in Globe, Arizona, June the 10th, 1922. I'm very proud to have been born there. I went to the Globe High School. I was president of all my classes, president of the student body, and valedictorian of my class. Now, I'm not bragging because it wasn't that big of a school. Uh, we were not rich people, we were poor people. My father was a, a hoisting engineer at the, the mines there. We worked very hard to support his family. My mother cooked and sewed, and, and I attribute all of my success to my parents. Rose's parents, John and Francis, were naturalized citizens from Austria. They instilled in their children the importance of being a good neighbor and a good citizen. Voting was so important to them that my mother would get up at six o'clock in the morning and bang every pot and pan in the house to be sure that we all went and voted. And you didn't go anywhere else unless you voted. It meant so much to them to come to this country and they, when you were old enough to vote, you registered and you voted and you had no excuse. I know what it meant to my parents and I know what it meant to me and also being Secretary of State, I know what it means to other people. Aside from small town life and her parents, Rose has had another lifelong influence, sports. She was an all-American softball player for the amateur Arizona Cantaloupe Queens. She had an offer to play professional basketball with the All-American Redheads, and she's been twice inducted into the Arizona Softball Hall of Fame. I attribute all of my successes, uh, besides my parents, of course, to sports. I learned a lot from sports. I learned to win, I learned to lose, and I learned to play the game fairly. During Rose's senior year in high school, an event took place that unknowingly set her life's path in motion. The, a man came through town there and said to me, I, I'm gonna run for office, and his name was Joe Hunt, I'm gonna run for state treasurer. And that time, the office of state treasurer was a two-year term, and I was not certainly not interested in uh, politics on a state level. I just thought he was a nice man, and all of my friends knew him and said he was a good man and I should help him. He said to me, uh, would you circulate some of my petitions? But back in those days, the petitions had 125 names on them. And I said to me, how many do you have? And he says, oh, about 12 or 13. I said, give them all to me and I'll take them. And I went home and gave them to my father and he was very popular at the mine, got them all filled out. And when he came back that same weekend, I had them all filled out and notarized because I was too young. I, I couldn't circulate and my dad did. When Hunt was elected, he brought Rose to Phoenix and gave her a job as a secretary. A scholarship to the University of Arizona had awaited Rose upon graduation. However, the war sidetracked her dream of studying psychiatry. He brought me to Phoenix and I made a whopping salary of $125 a month. And uh, back in those days, that would probably be equivalent to $1,200 now. Uh, because you could buy so much. My rent was $50, and you could buy a brand new Oldsmobile for $700, and uh, Cokes were a nickel. And when the war started, everything changed. But that's how I got my start, and I remained in the Capitol building uh, for 51 years. After stints in both the treasurer's office and at the tax commission, Rose left government and became business manager for Arizona Highways. During her tenure, the magazine modernized. The publication became entirely color and seemingly overnight gained 100,000 new subscriptions. Then, in 1954, one year into her new career, a call from Secretary of State Wesley Boland convinced her to once again return to government. He called me up and, and said, uh, I would like to, you to come up and work in my office, and, and I knew the legislators and so forth. And then first I was a secretary and worked in, in every phase of it, in his personal secretary, and then I became a, a assistant secretary of state. Mr. Boland was a very honest man. He, he wasn't politically ambitious. I think what I learned from him, he, that personal touch, he liked to go and he liked, he was Arizona. He liked to wear the Western attire, and, but I remained with him for 22 and a half years. 
And uh, then I went to the Department of Revenue, and that was when my whole life changed. In 1975, Rose was appointed Assistant Director of the State Revenue Department by Governor Raul Castro. What transpired next would catapult Rose's political career in a direction she never imagined. In 1977, Governor Castro left office for an ambassadorship, which meant Secretary of State Wesley Bolin, Rose's former boss, became Arizona's new governor. Feeling that Rose possessed the necessary familiarity with the job, Governor Bolin appointed her the new Secretary of State. Four months into her new position, Wesley Bolin passed away, which left Rose next in line to become governor. However, she had been appointed to the office and not elected. So that meant Attorney General Bruce Babbitt became governor and Rose remained Secretary of State, an office she held for over 10 years. Mr. Bolin appointed me in October of 1977, and then I ran for the office. I felt that knowing the office and knowing the people and working with them, I felt that I had a good chance to win, and I did win, and then I ran the second and ran the third time. With Rose's election in 1978, she became Arizona's first elected female Secretary of State. Her tenure saw her modernize and streamline the office with the utilization of computers. I tried to bring it up to a modern trend. Uh, when we first went there, of course, money was one thing, budget was one thing, but uh, we worked, uh, we made it the uniform commercial code, trademarks, trade name, the notary. We tried to put it on a modern basis so they got quick service, excellent service. And it, whether they were researching something, whether it was the law, and uh, computers weren't that big then, but uh, as time went on, we made everything available, uh, voting information to the public, to the whether you were a JP or whether you were just a, um, a, a governor, secretary of state or whatever. The small town girl's unintended rise to power continued in 1988 when the House of Representatives voted to impeach embattled Governor Evan Meekham. I paneled two recalls. And at that time, I was working on a recall. The, the petitions came in and so forth. But it, it, it was a sad day for our state because uh, those things don't have to happen. I mean, if people can remove you from office by voting against you or removing you from office, let the people speak their piece. But twice in my life, isn't it strange that I went to the, the next office because of, uh, of a removal? On April 5th, 1988, Rose was sworn in as Arizona's first female chief executive. Her task at hand was to bring order to a political scene that was in total chaos. When I became uh, governor, the first thing I did was write a letter to every employee and saw that it was in their paycheck or, and said there will not be any changes made. There will be no mass firing. Do your job, do it well. Why should everybody be fired for some particular, nothing that was their fault. And uh, they could rely on me. And if I told them that I'd be at a function, I was there. I, I let them know that they could, uh, my word was my bond. And I made it a point to go to the schools and tell them that that was uh, one of the most important things on my agenda was education and, uh, and mental health and health problems, the elderly and the children. And I think that that kind of just calmed the waters. In 1990, Rose ended her 51-year career in state government by not running for office. However, retirement from government has not met a departure from community service. She continues to work for numerous causes dear to her heart, including donating pieces from her remarkable Kachina collection. Yes, the small town girl has changed very little throughout the years. What motivated her since childhood is still what drives her today, helping people. Like a desert rose, we have seen her blossom, and from this rose's beauty, our lives have been enriched. I'm busier now than when I was governor. I haven't fully retired. I, I, main, I do all my own correspondence, write my speeches, and I handle all my mail, and I'm very active. I'm president of uh, our association there, Maryland Park West. But uh, I belong to so many organizations and try to help. I further my education. I call on retirement homes. I help people. I, ha I am a notary. I do a lot of work. And I get a lot of calls because my uh, phone is listed. And a lot of kids during the school year, they're studying this 
um, the office or they'll pick somebody that they have to write about. So I'm constantly reproducing stories and sending them to kids and then they write back and tell me they got a, an A or whatever. And uh, you know, that's nice. Now they're growing up too and you meet them at a, maybe at a sports event downtown or somewhere and they say, well, we heard you speak at Girls State or something. Isn't that wonderful that they didn't forget? And I think that's important. I hope that I'm remembered as someone that they could trust and that was very caring about our entire state and its people. When you're losing direction, baby, can you bend on me? Reason. If you're in need of some kindness, and you can't see the finest, can you bend on me? Brother, Ladies and gentlemen, 1999 history maker Rose Mofford. <laughs>